Welcome to the JVR Okwanda podcast, where people practitioners share leadership and business insights for managers. In this second installment, Dr. Yogi De Beer talks about your reputation as a leader and the gift of failure, the link between emotionally intelligent behavior and culture in your organization, tips to achieve psychological safety in your team, and two necessary conditions for dealing with diversity. Thoughts on the relationship between failure and your reputation. What's your thoughts on that? I'm going to use an analogy. Um, I'm going to talk about when you when you've got children. Uh, when you're a good parent, sometimes you really don't want them to fall. You don't want them to get hurt. You could do that to such an extent that they may be grown up and they've still never fallen. They don't know what it feels like and they've never been hurt. And I actually think that they then start life without understanding really basic things about life. Now, it's exactly the same in your work life. You can actually not become a a, a wise manager or a manager with insight and understanding if you've not failed. The big trick about failure is that you need to be very honest about it. If you keep on blaming others, you'll never learn. If you keep on saying, I failed because my wife didn't do that, I failed because I felt ill, I failed, you'll never learn. The depth of learning you get if you are brutally honest with yourself. I failed because I didn't see this risk coming. Mm. Immediately your next sentence is, if this happens again, what will I then do? Massive learning, such important learning. So for me, failure is part of life, as we should allow our kids to fail. Um, If Johnny didn't pass his mathematics this last quarter, so Johnny, why do you think that happened? And what can we do about that going forward? Exactly the same principle for all of us throughout our lives. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether you're an employee, entry-level employee, a manager, or an executive leader. Brutal honesty about, it didn't work, what can I learn from the fact that it didn't work? And then you pick yourself up because you've had an invaluable lesson, and now you use that going forward. And, And how do you think that's perceived by others? I actually think it's a gift to others. If you can show them as a manager how you work with failure, So the fact that you, as a manager, at times, can say to people, you know what, people, I take full responsibility for that. I'm not saying you should try and be a martyr. I'm I'm not talking about political games. But if this is the truth, Hmm. and you say to them, I actually made such a mistake, and I know we've lost whatever, let's say, a major client. And I would even go as far as to say, if you really respect your employees and they respect you, to say to the team, what can we learn from this? You're transparent, you're congruent, you say, I have thought about this so carefully, and I think I've learned this. But but provide a model, provide an example of how to work with it. I know some would regard it as maybe weakness, I honestly don't think it's weakness. I think it's the opposite. But it depends on how you do it. So I would not typically, if if something like that happens to me, and it's often happened to me, I wouldn't sit there as a pathetic fig- figure. I would still be the leader who says from a leadership perspective, people, what can we learn? This is what I've learned. Do you agree with that? Because then I think you're really, you really building, actually, emotional intelligence. You're actually building interpersonal relationships. And you're illustrating and modeling a really important skill in leadership. Mm. And, and you mentioned emotional intelligence now. Um, what do you think is important links between something like emotionally intelligent behavior and, and the culture of your team and the organization? You know, when they, when people talk about what followers or what employees criticize about managers, 
in all the research done, and there's been wonderful research done by excellent, excellent institutions, institutions and um, researchers, typically the four things that are often criticized, three things, I'm hoping I'll remember the fourth one. The one is definitely integrity. So integrity in the sense of what the person says, and what they do are quite different, or that they're looking out for themselves and they're not caring about the rest. So your your integrity is a massively important thing, and it falls very much into the also, not only, but also into the interpersonal space, how people perceive you, how they perceive to be managed. Um, the second thing that is very often criticized um, in terms of managers would be their interpersonal skills. As we started this discussion, goes very much to interpersonal skills. The two other things that could be criticized would be somebody's capability to do their job, and the, the other one would be a, an ability to implement vision, for instance. But the first two, for me, falls totally into the emotional intelligence space as well. It's not exactly the same. But interpersonal skills, how you work with people, and how trustworthy people perceive you to be, fall very close into the emotional intelligence field. And it's really critical to that 75% of people that say that they actually feel that their manager is the worst part of their job. Mm. It's very much related to those things. Mm. Um, how would you say, uh, we're talking about the 75% of employees now, and, and, and some of the literature talks a lot about creating psychological safety. So you, everyone's got different personality types and styles of leadership and management. Um, but, but one thing that comes to the fore quite a lot is psychological safety, that people need to feel safe um, in the team or in the organization. What would be some tips that managers need to think of uh, to create psychological safety for the employees? Um, the one thing I would say is that the, the manager needs to be so secure in himself, know himself or herself so well, that the, that the issue of diversity, and I'm now not talking about diversity in the, in the typical sense of the word, I'm really talking about it very broadly, that diversity of views, diversity of perceptions, diversity of value systems, diversity of, um, it could be sexual orientation, but that diversity for them is not an issue, that they can work with, and that they're secure enough in themselves to be able to respect a diversity of, of views. The second tip I would give is be very careful if you are only using interviews to, to onboard people into your team or into your organization. We have a fatal flaw as human beings, all of us, in that we like what we know and we value what we value in our personal lives. And the, the, the essential bias that could filter through in onboarding people just on the basis of an interview is that you keep on selecting people who are like you. So just be really careful of, of those two uh, elements. So to be able to ensure psychological safety, you need to be understanding of diversity. You need to allow diversity. You need to understand that every single person is so different to the other person and that, that people feel safe enough to be themselves and that they are safe enough that their views are respected and heard, mm. listened to, acknowledged. Mm. So, so would you say self-regard is, is a critical first step um, to be able to even, uh, you mentioned all the different kinds of diversity, um, self-regard being an important um, keystone almost mm. in accepting and being able to live in a diverse environment such as our country? I would say self-regard, but added to self-insight. Mm. Um, self-regard can sometimes, when self-regard is too high, could feel like arrogance. Okay. So self-regard in the sense of a 
confidence that I, as manager, I am able to do my work. I know where we're going. Mm. I know what needs to be done. Um, so that confidence, it could be a quiet confidence uh, that you see, but it has to go with a self-understanding so that when um, somebody comes with a view that is totally foreign to my own frame of reference, that it doesn't feel like a challenge to me personally, mm. that it's more a question of my confidence is such that I can accept another view and work with that. Mm. Um, yeah, so it needs to be combined with with the self-understanding. Okay. What would you tell a manager who's convinced that this is something that is either you either born with it or it's learned? Um, specifically, uh, I think often um, people, maybe not in our line of business, mm-hmm. um, feel that this is this might be something that's that's inherent that is that you either born with it or not. Um, what would you tell to someone like that who thinks that way? The- There are two ways of looking at it, and I'll give my own view in a second. So um, there there would be the view that you're born as a leader or you're born as a manager, and many people would say, I have seen Johnny from an early age show leadership uh, um, talent, uh, or or he's always been a a young manager or something Mm -hmm. like that. There is, however, the other view that as we mature through life, um, we can have all kinds of talents and strengths that could be really useful in a in a leadership position. So it's not always, there's not just one template of what management and leadership looks like. Mm. There are multiple templates of what that could look like. When I say that, therefore, my opinion is that it could be, it could be that there's natural ambition and natural leadership that you see from an early age, but it can also be something that develops over time. I have to say, however, I also do know that there are people who really do not want leadership positions. Mm-hmm. They really do want to be um, the, the the person that supports the leader. And in that regard, they may be highly co- competent, highly intelligent, and they would maybe more naturally go into a specialist type of position mm-hmm. and not necessarily a, a, a role of a manager or a, or a leader. And I think one should respect that. Would you say that uh, it's interesting that you bring that up? Um, and I, I think one can say, in fact, that it is quite fashionable, or it's, I guess, that's fashion for the last couple of decades, probably. It's very fashionable to be, to want to become a manager. What are some of the pitfalls, um, in that view? The, I think one needs to be very careful with just wanting the ticket or the title. It is a position of great responsibility. It's a position that is critical to the growth of the company within which you are a manager or if you manage a, a, um, a whole section or a, a whole company. It's really an important position. So it's much more and it has more responsibilities and demands to it than just the ticket, just the title. So people who want the title just because it strokes their own ego, that I would say be very careful of that. Um, there, there are some people talking about your empty suit syndrome, mm-hmm. that you may sit with a title, but actually you don't know how to do the, the, the resp- how to deal with the responsibilities of the position. Chances are excellent if you're sitting in such a position and you do not have somebody that can support or mentor or coach you that you're going to see your health suffering at some point, that you just find it more and more difficult to go to work, you don't enjoy what you're doing. And it may just be that you're in a position that's not ideal for you. The ticket is very attractive or the name, the title is attractive, but honestly it's not what you should should be doing doesn't fit you the way a a position should fit you Mm. Um, with that however I really do not mean that people cannot that they don't start somewhere and they're not experienced and that they grow into a managerial position Um, but it is important that you once again know yourself well enough to say but then 
to be able to do this the way I want to do it, this position, I need to read more, ask more, get coaching, yeah. get mentoring, attend courses, uh, whatever the case may be, to make sure that you feel as competent and in control of that position, that it adds value to the company as much as is possible. Mm. Um, what would you say, I mean, you mentioned, you you talk about um, the importance, the, the great responsibility um, in this job, in being a manager or a leader. Um, what are some of the pitfalls um, that one needs to look out for? You know, none of us are perfect. And when you look at people in leadership positions, if they're really doing leadership, not just because the title says it's a leader, but if they're really doing leadership or management because they take the responsibility seriously, um, then you need to understand that it is hard work. It, it's not something you do uh, just between lunch and dinner a little bit. It is a, p- a position of responsibility because in essence you're guiding people, you're adding to the bottom line, you're strategically working with a big entity, um, lots of expectations, brand uh, positioning. Um, so it's a position of responsibility. For those people who take that responsibility seriously, I think some of the pitfalls are that all of us as human beings have limited energy. So there may be a time, going to the example we used before, that you can actually burn out, that you find it just impossible to keep on concentrating at work because you are overwhelmed. You may also find that you're acting in ways that honestly is not your intention. And we talk about that as kind of showing... um, maybe a kind of reaction that's out of character and it's often stress, strain, exhaustion related. So, yes, you're always a person that that values the neatness and the accuracy of your work, but now you find yourself progressively more micromanaging and criticizing minute detail and you're saying, but that's not me. What's going on? Or you're a person that, that really enjoys the big picture But what you're finding is that more and more your thoughts are off the wall. It actually becomes kind of irrational examples. And once again, you're saying, but but that's not me. Please, that should be seen as a a clear indication of you need some me time. You, You actually need to get off this roller coaster for a period of time because you're just being human um, in the way that you are responding to to uh, whether it's threats or demands uh, in the workplace. Um, yes, I think it's re- I think it's really important that you that you just manage your own health, your own functioning in a very conscious way, mm-hmm. because there are real pitfalls given the responsibilities of the positions. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any any sort of final thought or idea that you'd like to share with listeners of this um, program whilst you have the opportunity in closing? There's been a lot of attention, and I hope that in these uh, programs that there will be some opportunity for that as well when leadership goes bad. Mm. So given the amount of turbulence in the world and in all over the, the, the continent, there may be the risk of sometimes seeing quite dark management, dark leadership, where it's not just a question of being burnt out or being um, exhausted or meaning well and really working hard, being tired, where there's actually another intensity to that, where there may really be people with um, ulterior motives in senior positions. So I think it's something that in literature and all over the world, it's attracting a lot of research attention. And I think in these, um, in the series that you're putting together, it would be interesting to look at how one could recognize such dark type of leadership and then what, what one could do practically about managing that. We'll definitely look into that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. 
Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you would like to receive the latest episode in your inbox, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you would like to share some of your insights, please send me an email at hofmeier at jvrafrica.co.za. Thank you.